All right, welcome back to the Hydrogeology playlist. I know it's been a while since I released an episode. Um, been out in the field, field work picked up summertime, so that's usually what happens. But uh, I'm going to be dropping two episodes to the, uh, well tonight. So episode eight will be uh, covering two different chapters, uh, groundwater flow to wells, and then soil moisture and groundwater recharge. And uh, so a water well, it's used to extract groundwater to fill domestic, municipal, industrial, and irrigational needs. It can also be used to control saltwater intrusions, which occur off of coastlines. Uh, uh, ocean water con contaminates uh, aquifers, freshwater aquifers. Um, it removes contaminated water, which is what I dominantly do. Uh, lowers water table for construction or mining projects. It relieves pressure under dams and it drains, drains farmlands. Also, you can use water wells to inject fluids into, a, uh, into uh, the aquifer. Uh, sometimes it's used to artificially recharge aquifers at rates greater than natural recharge, and that would typically happen in, say, an arid region um, where the water table is probably falling during summer, so you want to add some of the water from the nearby river, for example, to, uh, to kind of raise the water table. Um, so during well pumpage, the drawdown of the head in an aquifer around the well occurs. During an injection, the increase in head occurs. So the pumping, pumping cone, or cone of depression, is what forms when an aquifer around a pumping well is pumped. Uh, and as the water level declines, it'll form this cone it's called a cone of depression and uh, steady state flow is when co uh, head is constant with time and unsteady flow is when uh, head changes with time radio flow which is why a cone of depression forms um, when you're dealing with radio flow you're assuming that the aquifer is isotropic and homogeneous it has radial symmetry and radial flow is flow that moves towards the well pictured over here as if along spokes of a wagon wheel towards the hub it's dealt with by using uh, polar coordinates so one way to uh, determine the characteristics of an aquifer is called a pump test so if the formation characteristics of an aquifer are not known an aquifer or pump test can be made. The well is pumped at a known rate and the response of the pontiometric surface or groundwater, groundwater elevation is, uh, is measured. And this shows, you know, over five hours, it'll reach, uh, what's it called? Steady state um, during this pump test. It'll reach steady state here, and then significantly decrease in uh, in drawdown, and then you know you get a smaller one over here, where steady state isn't achieved anymore, and it'll start increasing, and then it'll reach steady state again. Um, this gives you an idea of how well the uh, the aquifer is transmitting water through it, so hydraulic conductivity. So steady state conditions. If the well pumps long enough, the water level may reach a state of equilibrium, so no further drawdown uh, with time. The region around a pumping well where head has been lowered is the cone of depression. Uh, when equilibrium has been achieved, the cone of depression stops growing because it has reached the recharge boundary, which a recharge boundary, such a, on this picture, would be like a, a stream, for example. Um, and that, that would be steady state conditions. The hydraulic gradient of the cone of depression causes water to flow at a constant rate, rate from the recharge boundary to the well. And the assumption of uh, radial symmetry means that the recharge bound, boundary has unlikely uh, circular geometry. Okay, so this one wasn't in the book, but I, I think it's kind of important to uh, to 
to note. So when, when you're sampling a groundwater well, you typical rule, at least where I work in the state I work in, is you want to pump the well to three well volumes to get a representative uh, sample of the aquifer because they believe that if it's just one well volume that you sample from, the water has stagnated a little bit. So if you pump three, you're not getting that stagnated water. You're getting water that's coming from, you know, um, all around the well um, in the surrounding areas. It's, it's trying to reach equilibrium, so obviously more water is coming in uh, through the formation and into the, to where, where the well is so you can pump it out. Um, so the calculation is pretty simple. You, uh, so say we have a well depth of 125 and a static water level or groundwater elevation level of 100 feet. You subtract those two and then multiply it because the well casing is two inches. That's a uh, 0.165. So you multiply the difference between the static water level and well depth and um, the well casing. And that'll give you one well volume, which is in this case 4.125. And you multiply that by three, and you get 12. Point, basically four gallons. Um, after you've pumped 12.4 gallons out of this well, that's a representative uh, sam potential sample. So that's when you would do your sample. Okay, so a slug test. Aquifer tests are expensive, so in this case, you could use a slug or bell down test um, in a small diameter monitoring well. It can be used to determine the hydraulic conductivity of the formation in the immediate vicinity of the monitoring well. Um, the known volume of the water quickly drawn or water added, the rate at which the water level falls or rises is measured. And in, in this picture, as you can see, you can either, either measure the difference um, in height as it and this is a falling head test. If the water level increases, for example, you can measure the uh, change in height there, or you can measure the change in height in a rising head slug test. And you know, over a certain amount of time, as that that change in uh, head occurs, that can give you an idea of what the hydraulic conductivity in the uh, in the formation that you're taking the water out of. Uh, can be determined. So the effect of hydro hydrogeologic boundaries. A hydrogeologic boundary could be the edge of an aquifer, a, rechar a region of recharge to a fully confined artesian aquifer, or a source of recharge such as a stream or lake. Uh, it can be either a recharge or barrier boundary. A recharge boundary is a region where the aquifer is replenished such as a uh, stream or a lake. And then a barrier boundary is an edge of an aquifer where it terminates by thinning or abutting low permeability formation or has been eroded away, which is why I included this uh, picture. This is stratigraphy, <laughs> if you guys remember this. Um, it's typically looked at when you're dealing with petroleum geology, but this gives you an idea of the thinning and abutting. So this, this uh, say this, what is this, a sandstone. The sandstone right here is abutting against a mud-rich uh, formation, so obviously that would be a, an aquitard in this case, not a high hydraulic conductivity. So this would be a boundary to this potential aquifer right here, which is a sandstone, and let's just say it's it has a good hydraulic conductivity. So boundaries have the most dramatic impact on drawdown of a pumped well for aquifer with no source of vertical recharge. So uh, basically a clay is what it's talking about there. But I have a lot of situations where I'll pump a well and it'll go dry after the first well volume. It won't even make it to the three. So in that case, we just, we sample. We wait until it reaches a certain point, a certain elevation before we sample it. But yeah. So this is the second part of the episode. Soil moisture and groundwater recharge. So there's three phases in the Vado zone or the unsaturated zone. There's a solid, liquid, and gas. You have organic matter, minerals as your solids, and then you have water as your liquid, 
and then you have water vapor and other gases as your as your gases so the solid phase which is soil is which can be created through in situ weathering or from sediments transported from another source or it can be created from unweathered bedrock which is in this case in situ weathering um, mineral grains may be dis disaggregated such as sand grains in a dune um, aggregates or peds are smaller grains that may be bound by organic matter to form larger units and peds or aggregates have specific orientations that form uh, soil structures and a soil struct uh, sorry soil texture is determined by the distribution of size fractions of mineral grains present and kind of review porosity of the soil is percent of uh, void space porosity equals the volume of the voids divided by the total volume of the of the material so uh, and then soil moisture can be measured mathematically or through geophysical methods such as recitivity and I, I kind of liked this picture um, it kind of shows you know how pretty much unsaturated the uh, the uh, Vados zone is but you'll have uh, leakage towards the uh, the saturated zone or the phreatic zone through fractures or you know and these are this means dense uh, sorry <laughs> dense non aqueous uh, petroleum liquids or product we can just call it product but uh i, I like th this picture and kind of showing you know the veto zone isn't completely saturated it can have maybe some some saturation near the top and then it'll dry out or you know saturation right here in the cap capillary fringe um and speaking of capillary fringe, capillarity and the capillary fringe, if fluid pressures are measured above the water table, the pressures will be found to be negative with respect to the local atmospheric pressure. And this is called tension. Uh, air may also be present in the void above the water table if the air pressure equals the atmospheric pressure above the water table. Um, water vapor is also present in, in the voids above uh, the water table. Water molecules at the water table are subject to upward attraction due to surface tension of the uh, air-water interface and the molecular attraction of liquid and solid phases, and that's called capillarity. And in a tube of small diameter free water surface, it will assume, sorry, free water, the free water surface in the tube uh, will assume the shape uh, with minimum surface area. The attraction of solid for liquid will draw liquid up into the tube. Uh, the upward force will eventually be offset by the weight of the column of water. Water is under tension. Pressure is less than atmospheric pressure. This is the capillary force. And this is a good little diagram to kind of give you a visual on how uh, capillarity, uh, the capillarity, capillary force uh, exists. Okay, so... The capillary pores in the unsaturated zone can can draw water up from the saturated zone and fine grain soils this capillary fringe can saturate above the water table head is negative which indicates uh, the capillary fringe is part of the vados zone the unsaturated zone is best defined as the zone where soil moisture is under tension because of irregularity irregularities in size of pores capillary water does not rise to even even that's supposed to be even height above the water table it creates this irregular shape above the water table kind of uh, hilly looking um, higher and fine grain soils because of uh, the greater tension created by smaller pore openings and when you think fine grain soils you think silts and clays capillary fringe can be a way for the groundwater to evaporate if the water table is close enough to the surface as water evaporates it's replaced by water from the unsaturated zone through capillarity so you have water evaporating into the atmosphere so water will in the capillary fringe will go back down into the uh, into the water table if the liquid coating is too thick 
it can be pulled down by gravity like if it's really saturated basically if evaporation can move through the pores uh, as water vapor I don't know why I put if but yeah evaporated uh, water uh, molecules can move through the pores as water vapor um, movement of vapor through the unsaturated zone is a function of the temperature and humidity gradients and soil molecular uh, diffusion coefficients for water vapor and soil so water vapor movement would probably not be very high in a place without humidity such as an arid desert southwest region of the United States um, whereas in Louisiana this is probably you know there's probably a lot of water vapor moving through the uh, through pores so soil water water in the vados zone that is available to plants it extends to the depth of plant roots uh, you can also call it a belt of soil water and water moves through this belt um, spring soil moisture is high due to uh, snow melt and in some cases high precipitation and then in the summer it can be low certain places you know you have your monsoon season so maybe soil moisture is high uh, during certain portions of the summer um, and then when you're dealing with high soil moisture it can be used as recharge to an aquifer if it's high enough and if the water table is close enough to the surface so the next episode will be about uh, regional groundwater flow i appreciate you guys watching and subscribe and like the video if it uh if it tickles your fancy <laughs> and uh it helps the channel uh thank y'all